Welcome to Moriel TV. My name is Joshua, live with James Jacob Prash for This Week in Prophecy, February 4th, 2019. Jacob. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Please forgive the mess on back of me. We're in the process of unpacking in a new office, and we're having major weather problems that are impeding the progress. Be that as it may, let's move on. This Week in Prophecy, we're speaking to you from the 4th of February, 2019. This Week in Prophecy featured last week are reports of the actions of Andrew Cuomo signing into law legislation that would have allowed abortion up until the point of the end of the third trimester of pregnancy. An even more radical bill is being pushed in Virginia What's odd about Virginia, if not shocking, is that the governor of Virginia is himself a pediatric neurologist. Now, as a pediatric neurologist, he certainly understands the ramifications of what he's saying concerning terminating a baby anytime up to the point of birth. He's been accused widely of infanticide, but he's backtracked trying to say he only meant in cases of severe handicap and so forth, this is medically and legally being disputed, as well as factually contested. The same week, though, as many Christians prayed, and this shows the power of prayer, a photo of him from his medical college yearbook with a black face and a Ku Klux Klan outfit emerged in the major media. Abortion bill draws GOP outrage against Virginia Governor Northam, comma, Democratic legislators. That's an actual headline. Republicans whine too much. Infanticide, not a big deal. And then all of that changed, you heard. On today, the first day of Black History Month, the site called Big League Politics uncovered the photo Trace just told us about. What's so interesting about it is that Ralph Northam spent a lot of his last campaign calling his opponent racist again and again and again. The closing of that campaign was an unending flurry of ads putting his Republican opponent up against pictures of what happened at Charlottesville, the atrocities at Charlottesville. There was no evidence that his opponent was racist, but Northam said it a lot. And yet, strikingly, Northam's opponents never took pictures of himself in blackface or in a Klan robe. So there is some irony in this story. Now, I personally find the Ku Klux Klan to be utterly, obviously, disgusting and revolting. It's thoroughly anti-Christian. It's thoroughly bigoted. People like David Duke are as bad on one extreme as Louis Farrakhan are on the other. It's appalling. But it does show that the Democratic Party really has no allegiance to the plight of blacks. It was the party, as we've always said, of slavery, segregation, and Jim Crow. It simply uses blacks as political pawns the way they've always done. Having said that, he's in political trouble. Former Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe said that he thinks he will resign. Ironically, when the White House blasted this, when the White House spoke out against putting black makeup on your face to look like a black person and, and getting dressed up like a member of the Klan, when President Trump objected to it and said it was completely inappropriate that the governor of a state should be such a person. President Trump was called a racist for saying it by a Democratic senator from Ohio. You're a racist if you don't speak out against the Klan, and you're a racist if you do. It's all politics. The Democratic Party does not care about racism, and either does the mainstream Republican Party. It's not about black or white, as we've always said. It's about green. But we do thank God that this calamity has fallen upon Ralph Northrop, governor of Virginia. May the Lord set his hand against him for his position on late-term abortion. As appalled as I am over his racist actions when he was in medical college, what he said about third trimester abortion, that should have prompted in a better America demands for his resignation. It's all, again, political consideration. 
but the Lord has raised his hand. He apologized for what he did, but now is trying to backtrack and say it wasn't him. It seems he cannot make up his mind if he did it or he didn't. It does appear to be him, and he has a situation now where if it wasn't him, why did he apologize for it? Why didn't he just deny it was him? He's got himself in. And I believe it's the hand of God against him. Thank you for your prayers. But let's move on to world events this week in prophecy. The Iraq military found three Iranian missiles. They were pointed at the American air base at Ain al-Assad near the Syrian border where American air operations against ISIS are carried out. This is an important base in controlling the region and in the future prevention of any Iranian efforts to infiltrate across northern Iraq into Syria. They were discovered by the Iraqi military before they were launched, but it does show that Iran is preparing for direct military action against the United States. They may only be posturing at this point or putting the weapon systems in place as some kind of a deterrent or for propaganda reasons. But the missiles were deployed and targeted at American positions this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, the real news of the Middle East comes from Lebanon. The Maronite Roman Catholic president, a figurehead, Chief of State, Michael Ayoun, supported the new government that is essentially controlled by Iran via uh, Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah. You have a Hezbollah government now in Lebanon being placated to by the Maronite Roman Catholic president. Again, he may be trying to safeguard the position of Roman Catholics under Hezbollah, given the persecution that the phalangist Roman Catholic Maronites in the South have experienced historically in the past. I don't know what his game is, but Nasrallah is basically calling the shots now in Syria on behalf of Iran. This creates a northern tier threat once again to Galilee. You have an Israeli-Iranian line of conflict, not only on the Golan Heights, but in Matula, in the area of Rosh Nikra, in Ma'alot. This is quite serious. There are threats to Kiryat Shmona once again, with the massive deployment of Katushas and other, and other missiles generally of Russian manufacture being pointed at Galilee once again. A scenario replaying Operation Latani, the Israelis forced incursion to stop the missiles being fired. The last exchange in 2006 is on the verge of exploding again. The situation has just doubled. What had been a potential Israeli-Syrian conflict in Syria is now a potential Israeli-Iranian conflict in Syria and in Lebanon. These events in Lebanon have been underreported and downplayed in the international media, but they are very serious. It's unclear if the Israelis have wanted to kill Nasrallah or not in the past. There's a good argument, many would say, for the Israelis taking him out if they're able to do so. It's a strategic quagmire. What we do know is this. Under international pressure, the Israelis withdrew from Lebanon for a false peace. The fact that that peace was false was proven in 2006. The mistake was made of not creating a permanent Christian enclave in southern Lebanon as a buffer between Galilee and the radical Islamic controlled areas closer to Beirut. But essentially, Beirut, once again, has become a terrorist state in the sense that it's controlled by terrorists, by Hezbollah, who operate in conjunction with Assad Syria, 
but at the behest of their Iranian masters. This has transpired this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, the U.S. Senate, Republican factions of conservatives in the Senate have moved to block President Trump's proposed withdrawal radically from Syria at the present time for fear of creating the kind of vacuum that Barack Obama created that gave rise to ISIS. There is a conflict within the conservative camp, even among normally pro-Trump members of the Senate and Trump supporters. Again, Mr. Trump may be playing a political game, forcing or attempting to prompt the Egyptians, the Jordanians, and other moderate Arab countries to take a more aggressive role against the Iranian threat in Syria, with American support from Iraq, but not with American boots on the ground inside of Syria. This situation, again, is very complicated because of the conflict between the Kurds and Turkey. This week in prophecy, Iran was attempting a rapprochement, probably with Putin, but certainly with Turkey, to fill in the void left by the Americans if they withdraw. There's again more going on here than meets the eye. Mr. Trump is taking action that obviously has aspects that are not being publicly discussed. But the fears of the conservative faction within the Senate are fears that we've expressed ourselves and are justified. It's taking place this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, as a democratically appointed president assumes nominal power and position inside of Venezuela with the support of the United States, the European Union, and other democratic countries. The White House has announced that it will not rule out military intervention in Venezuela against the unpopular and illegal Maduro government inherited by Maduro from the late dictator Victor Chavez. Mr. Putin is most unhappy. Again, we see the saga of the Cuban Missile Crisis and everything that's taken place with the Contras, the Sandinistas. It's still an ongoing, ongoing reality in Latin America, and it persists to this very moment. What is important, however, is this. The United States, the Trump administration, has imposed new restrictions on Venezuelan oil. This is going to hurt the Maduro regime even more critically. It's already in a state of virtual economic collapse. The fact that the United States can do this with Venezuela, an OPEC member, being the world's largest proven reserve holder. Venezuela has more proven reserves than Saudi Arabia, although it is not light crude like Saudi Arabia. There's more oil. Simultaneous with what's taking place with American impositions against Iran and Iranian oil trade. And the United States can do this without the fear of escalating oil prices out of control, with oil still remaining 50 to 60 dollars a barrel with the West, uh, West Texas intermediate pricing system used in the United States. This is a direct result of the ongoing expansion of American fracking. OPEC has lost its power. Countries like Venezuela cannot do what they did under Chavez, neither can the Iranians, neither for that matter can the Saudi Arabians. But let's push ahead. Watch Venezuela. How much longer Maduro can endure is quite a question. Russia cannot bail him out economically, and Russia is not likely to want to get involved militarily. 
it's only a matter of time before something likely transpires in terms of a transition of power to a new government. Thank God if that happens. Let's look ahead now. This week in prophecy, Iran has announced on the anniversary of the Iranian revolution, when the Shah was deposed and after Bani Sadar, the late Ayatollah Khomeini came to power, the development and commissioning of a new Iranian cruise missile having a range of 1,300 kilometers, in other words, capable of striking Israel from within inside of Iran. This follows a series of events that have been taking place since December. In response to an Israeli missile attack on Iranian positions using the Delilah missile, an Israeli cruise missile system, on the 29th of December, an Iranian Fejir 5 was fired at central Israel, but successfully intercepted. Now, when you have Iranians firing missiles at Israel itself, but being intercepted, you already have a powder keg, something that could very easily explode into a war. But then on the 21st of January of this very month, a Fatah 100 missile was fired at the Golan, likewise intercepted. But this new Iranian missile, announced by the Defense Minister Amir Hatami, it is from the Sesmar family of missiles of the Sesmar generation of cruise missiles. It is not as advanced as the American Tomahawks or of Russian cruise missiles. It is probably not as advanced as the Israeli cruise missiles, but it is still a cruise missile with cruise missile avionics internal guidance system. Cruise missiles can take advantage of terrain flying at low altitude, going through valleys, hovering over ridge lines, going through gaps in mountains, making it virtually impossible to down in most cases. The only time, the only technology that exists for downing cruise missiles are used in the defense of American aircraft carriers where there's an open sea and there is no terrain or terrestrial turf for the missiles to take advantage of to avoid detection by radar systems and by radar guided anti-missile systems. This is something of a game changer. Now Iran has a missile that Israel cannot stop. Will this push Israel closer to taking preemptive action? Now that this is taking place with this new deployment of this new weapon, at the same time, Iran has managed to get control of Lebanon under Nasrallah and open a new front on the border with Galilee. But it's happening this week in prophecy. We don't want to be the boy who cried wolf with a Gog and Magog scenario. On the other hand, we do not wish to ignore Daniel chapter 10. The prince of Persia, the demonic power over Iran, will emerge as a threat to the existence of Israel in the last days before Jesus comes. And we've seen a more acute development of this reality this week in prophecy. American-Russian relations have continued to deteriorate this week in prophecy. The United States has withdrawn from its intermediate range missile treaty with Russia due to repeated violations of it by Russia. Now Russia has responded by withdrawing itself. If this will herald a new arms race or not between Russia and the United States remains to be seen. Russia's problem 
is, of course, its economy and the low price of oil. It is essentially export dependent on oil. And again, American fracking is taking its toll on the economic muscle that Russia could potentially have. Russia would have a very difficult time in funding such an arms race. It would not be easy for the United States, but it would be excruciating for Russia to attempt it. Again, how much of this is political posturing? How much is actual strategic substance? Cannot be definitively stated or quantified at the present time with the data in the public domain. But we do know that it's taking place wars and rumors of wars, see that you are not shaken. Watch Lebanon. Things have now expanded, and they've expanded radically. Can the United States and the cooperating Iraqi and possibly Kurdish forces in northern Iraq prevent an Iranian crescent from Lebanon, from the Mediterranean, through Syria into Iran. Iran would love to do what ISIS failed to do, create a caliphate. ISIS wanted a Sunni caliphate. Iran would want a Shia caliphate. Can the United States and Israel stand in opposition to this? Additionally, neither Israel or the United States has the technology to stop a terrestrially launched cruise missile. And now Iran has, by their standards, a more advanced version of one, putting the major population centers of Israel well into its range. It is no coincidence that two and a half weeks ago, it was announced by Benjamin Netanyahu that Israel had developed a more advanced cruise missile that nothing in the Middle East can stand up to and nothing can stop it. This may be what had been known in the Cold War as a mad scenario, mutually assured destruction. You may be able to attack us but bear in mind, even a preemptive attack will not prevent a counterattack. Once you have a mad scenario, things can go one of two ways. In my own youth in the United States, I recall when Nikita Khrushchev came to New York, to the UN, removed his shoe as the leader of the Soviet Politburo and began pounding his shoe on the podium in the United Nations General Assembly, saying, we will bury you. He was seen as a potential upset to the mad balance of power that prevented Russia from attacking America the Soviet Union from attacking America or America from attacking the Soviet Union due to mutually assured destruction. It was a mad balance of power, but although mad, it worked. It was not mad, it was mutually assured destruction. Mad was a misnomer, except that it would have been mad to launch a nuclear attack knowing there would be a counterattack from submarines launching into continental ballistic missiles, even if you took out the entire Soviet Union or the entire United States preemptively, there could be a counterattack from submarines. It was just mad. Khrushchev was deposed in a matter of months. The Soviets did not want a madman with his finger on the button. In the book, The Final Days, we know that the corrupt American president, Richard Nixon, was inundated, was stoned, effectively intoxicated on tranquilizers and alcohol, trying to save his neck during the Watergate scandal. Henry Kissinger and General Haig 
kept him under control when he called a stage three nuclear alert against the Soviets during the Yom Kippur War. Now, we approve of the American assistance given to Israel at that time, but it was also a situation where there was a genuine fear that a desperate and an increasingly desperate Richard Nixon, who was besought by the Watergate scandal, would exploit the conflict in the Middle East to the point of a threat of nuclear exchange along the lines of what took place in the Cuban Missile Crisis in order to save his neck politically. At that point, the Republican Party establishment moved against him. People like Gerald Ford, Henry Kissinger realized he had to go. The conservative faction of the U.S. Senate, led by Barry Goldwater, realized it was time for Nixon to go. This kind of reasoning prevailed in an environment of mutually assured destruction when you were dealing with the Soviet Union, who for all their corruption at least thought rationally, and the United States. When you're dealing with fundamentalist Islam, who believe the only assurance of salvation is in shahadi, to die as a martyr in jihad. We ought not think that there's a mutually assured destruction that will give a deterrent. The mutually assured destruction may be there, but it really will be mad. Again, as has been said of Shia fundamentalists, they love death the way civilized human beings love life. Of course, there are Sunnis who are just as fanatical. But Iranian fundamentalism, to understand it, read the book of Daniel chapter 10. That is what is taking place this week in prophecy. Again, we never point these things out for purposes of scaremongering but as matters for urgent prayer. Jesus was clear. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars, but the end is not yet. Yes, these things point to the fact that Jesus is returning, but we should not become rambunctious because of war talk. We need to watch and pray. Thank you so much for listening to This Week in Prophecy. My name is Jacob Prash. Once again, my apologetic regrets for the mess on back of me. We're trying to unpack in some very, very foul and inclement weather uh, to get the new office properly organized. May take a bit of time. God bless and thanks. 